Is he bigger than your current circumstances? Is he bigger than your situation? Is he, is he bigger than that boss that is treating you unfairly? Is he bigger than your sickness? Is he bigger than your job situation? Is he bigger than the relationships that are kind of going sideways? How big is your God? And see, that's an easy question to, 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 to ponder on a Sunday morning when you're worshiping God, you're, you're high on the spirit and things are good, but when you go back into real life on Monday, that's when I want you to ask, ask, ask that question for yourself. How big is my God? Because that's just a real question that we have to ask ourselves. How big is our God? See, it's Isaiah 55. 8 and 1, 8 through 11. Isaiah 55, 8 through 11. It just simply says this. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways. Says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven... And do not return there, but the waters water the earth and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please. And it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. See, when I ask that question, how big is your God? Hopefully your response is way bigger than me. Hopefully you can understand he's way bigger than any situation that I may be dealing with. Because after you've done everything that you can do, after you've come up with all the, the strategic plans and the, the creative ways of doing things, after you've found a way of made one, Clark Atlanta University. Yes. And you've done the best that you could do. Still there's challenges. Still there's trials and tribulations. And then you finally realize that it's not something that I can do in and of myself. That there has to be a God that is above and beyond all of the things that I may be experiencing. See, in this book, Isaiah is a prophet. He's talking to the people uh, of Israel, and he's talking throughout the book about challenges that they've been facing. He's talking to them about uh, their uh, deserting God and going off and doing things on their own. Uh, but he also talks about them coming back to God and returning to God, and, and therein lies the blessings. And he talks about there being a remnant that will come back to raise back up this holy nation that God had called. But as Isaiah is, 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 is talking to the people, as he is speaking the very words of God, he's talking to a people who are in exile, who have been conquered by a foreign nation, who, who have come in and taken the people of Israel away, who have, who have taken them to their foreign land. They have taken all of their leaders and taken them to a foreign land. And those who remained in the land were not under their own control. They were living a life of exile. Self-determination was no longer theirs. They were living a life that was not controlled by themselves. And, and the people of God, the people of Israel, they were challenged. They were challenged because they had been worshiping the God, this all-powerful God, this, this creator of the universe, this God that's supposed to sit up high and look down low, this God that's bigger and greater than anything we could ever imagine, but they were living in a situation that they were in exile. They weren't in control of their own destiny. They were not the master of their fate nor the captain of their soul. They were being controlled by another. And in our life, we look at our life and, and, and we see that our lives, it feels like it's being controlled by a foreign dictator. That you're not living the life that you want to live because it's dictated by your nine to five. It's dictated by your kids. It's dictated by your spouse. It's dictated 
by those who you're in relationship with is dictated by everybody but yourself. And then you come back and you look at God and you say, God, you're supposed to be this great God. You're supposed to be this God that can do anything. You say I'm the head and not the tail. You say I'm above and not beneath. But I can't see it that way because my current perspective is different than what I read and what is preached to me. How big is your God? Is he bigger than those circumstances? Is he bigger than those situations? Is he bigger than the sickness? And, and, and is he bigger than your haters? Is he bigger than your job? Is he bigger than anything that could be happening to you? I know it's difficult to understand why God would allow for the things to happen in your life the way that they've been happening. And you are trying to figure this thing out. You say, God, why? Why would you do this to me? And, and you want to be faithful to him because you still believe in him. You believe that he's the creator of the universe. You believe he's above. You believe that he's high. You believe he can do all things, but it's not playing out in your life that way. So now you're trying to balance this reality, this, this theory of what you say conceptually about God, and then, and then balance that with what's playing out in your life. And it seems to be tilted the wrong way. That balance is, is not like it's balancing in the wrong way. And you're saying, why, God, why are you doing this to me? And you don't want to be too mad at him because you feel like you're being disrespectful. But something got to change, God. God. See, that's what the people of Israel, that's what they were experiencing. They were in exile. They were supposed to be this holy people. The, the, the friend of God. But God had them in a, a, a perspective, a situation of exile. And God simply said to the people of Israel through Isaiah, he said, For as the heavens is higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. I know you don't understand why you're in this situation, but God is saying the way that My, 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 my ways of doing things are not like your strategic plan would have played out for you in your life. He said, look, I get it. You don't understand, but that's all right. You don't have to understand my ways or my thoughts, but just trust me. Amen. That's what God is saying to us today. He said, don't worry. I understand. It's, it's, it's a hard knock life. There's trials and there's tribulations in your life. Things are not like and you can't explain it. You can't explain it to the people who are looking on. It's kind of like, like Job in the story of Job. When, when, when God was allowing all these things to happen to Job, Job's friends came over and was like, explain this. You say your God is this, but look what's going on in your life. Then they said, oh, well, you must have done something wrong. I'm here to tell you all the way that you're living what's going on in your life isn't necessarily because of something wrong you have done. All right. So let's get that clear right now. Many of you all are faithful to him. You, you honor him. You, you spend time with him. You, 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 you work to be obedient to him. And there's still these challenges and these obstacles that are in your life. And then you find yourself trying to explain this to your friends and to your family. You say you serve this great God, but your life doesn't reflect what you preach. And God is simply saying that my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. He said, don't get confused, y'all. Don't get it twisted. I still got your back. Yes, God. I still want the best for your life. He said, I know you can't see it in your current situation, but what he said, I got you. He said, you can't look through the lens of time. See, we've been looking at life through the lens of what we can see right in front of us. See, we've been looking through these foggy lens of time. You know how when you're in, in fog or when it's real cloudy outside, and, and you ever been in one of those really, really foggy situations driving or even outside and you can only see right directly ahead of you? You can't see down the road like you would typically. You can only see right in front of you. That's how we're looking at life. 
We're looking at life through this foggy lens of time, which only focuses on our current situation and circumstances. See, see, but God is looking through the lens, through this clear lens, where you can see way down the road, where nothing is obstructing your view. He's looking through this clear lens of eternity, y'all. Through eternity. And, and he said, I know your situation and time is not what you want it to be right now. I get it. You're not too happy right now. But you're looking through the lens of time. And I'm telling you, it's time to get up higher and look through the lens of eternity. My God. Because God is most concerned about how you're going to spend eternity with him. And, and what you experience here in time is only intended to get you where he wants you to be in eternity. That's what he wants. He wants you to, to, to look at your situation. Yes, you're going to be looking at time because he's placed us in the midst of time. We were born in time. We have a birthday. We will have a death day. That's all in time. But God is so much higher. He's, he's, he's above. He's the creator of all things. And, and, and he's saying, yes, I placed you in time. But guess what? Eternity eats up time every time. Eternity eats up time every time. So that's when God was speaking to the people of Israel. He was just saying, hey, you know, my ways are much bigger than yours. The way I look at things are much higher than yours. That there is beyond what you can ever imagine. He even gets us a, 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 a little thing. Because see, God, even in time, is concerned about your time. He's concerned about your situation. So I'm not saying that, yes, even though he focuses on eternity, that he's given up on your time, and he's just going to allow whatever to happen in your time. He, he wants our time to, to be redeemed. He wants our time to, to be good. He tells us in Jeremiah 29 and 11, he says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Amen. He says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. He's not speaking in eternity, he's speaking in time. His thoughts for you are for hope and the future. Amen. He wants you to live life in this time, in this, in this lens of time, he wants you to be happy. Yes. He wants you to be living a life of peace. He wants you to be living in a good condition, but what happens to you, good or bad, doesn't dictate what happens in eternity. And let's look at, let's look at this. Let's look at Joseph. Joseph. Joseph, his great, great granddaddy was Abraham. So let's just look at the genealogy. He had Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. And one of his youngest sons was Joseph. Now Joseph had this dream. This dream that God would do great things in his life. That God would do these amazing things. He would be this tremendous leader uh, in his life. And then Joseph messed around and told his brothers and his dad what God had showed him. Because in his dream it also showed him that not only will people serve him, but his brothers and daddy will serve him too. So just a little lesson. You don't always share your dreams with everybody. Don't, don't, don't just, I know you, the Lord told me this, so I'm going I'm to yell it to the rooftop. No, no, no. Because when you share your dreams and they start saying what God is doing in your life, guess who comes quickly out? Haters. Haters. They come. They come. Get, and you're thinking, all I'm trying to do is what's right by God. I just want to do what's good. But the haters come quickly. And so unfortunately, the haters in this story was Joseph's brothers. Joseph's brothers, they heard the story, they heard his dreams, they heard what he said God was going to do. And what they tried to do? Plotted to kill him. They wanted to take his life. And then one of the brothers convinced him, nah, I don't want this blood on my hand, let's just get rid of him. They sold him into slavery and into Egypt to serve in the Potiphar's house. And so now he had this big dream that he was going to be this great leader. He told somebody his dream, his brothers, they sold him into slavery. So now he went from, in his dream, this big leader, to now a slave. Wow. 
in a foreign land, in Egypt. See, his current situation wasn't playing out like he felt God was calling for him. And now he saw in his dream. To sir, current situation at this time was that he was now a slave. He went from this big time leader to be this lonely slave. But even in the situation that he was in, the Bible says God prospered him in all that he did. And he gained so much favor in Potiphar's house that Potiphar put him over all of his household responsibilities. So he was doing good. So yes, he was, he was in slavery, but he wasn't living like a slave no more. Because he was given this authority and this responsibility. But you know, just like people see you beginning to elevate, right? Who comes again? Your haters. And, and the hater in this situation looked like Potiphar's wife. See, sometimes the haters look real nice. Real cute like, right? Real fine like, you know, and, 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 and she tempted him, she tempted him to, to, to sleep with her. So now that Potiphar wasn't doing what Potiphar was supposed to be doing because she was looking at the slave. She was looking at the slave to, all right. So, but he refused. He lived in integrity. So not only was he prospering, and he was working hard to do what he was doing in his place. He was also this man of integrity. And he refused to lay down with Potiphar's wife. And what happened? When he refused it, she lied on him. Told her husband, he tried to lay down, he tried to sleep with me. And guess what? I got this piece of clothes because she told tore his clothes when he was trying to flee. The Bible says, flee from sin, right? Flee from sexual sin, right? See, when I was young, I didn't know how to fail. I thought I could just do it in my own mind, and I would fail way too often. The Bible says, flee. He fled, but she set him up. So, so Papa does what a husband does. Instead of killing him, he sent him to jail. So now, he went from, in his, in his, in his vision, being this great leader, to being a slave, got a little power as a slave, but now he in jail now. So he, he, he went from here to here, now he in jail. He's here. Looks nothing like what God had called for him to do. Looks nothing like the dream that God had given him. But he's in jail. But even in jail, the Bible says this, that God prospered him in all that he did. God was prospering him even in jail to the point that the, 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 the prisoner, the prison gave him responsibility of all what does that look like? You in jail and they can make you responsible for all the prisoners? He was even prospering where he was in jail, but yet it still didn't look like what God had called for him to do. So he went from, you know, he went from being this leader and this vision to, to being the slave in Potiphar's house. Potiphar's house, a wife hated on him, sent him to jail. He still began to elevate in jail, became responsible for all of the prisoners. And then somebody that was serving time with him, he helped him out in jail. And when he got out, he said, all I ask of you is to look out for me when you get out. And you know how it is. You ever help somebody out? Right? They get blessed. And then they forget that you done helped them out or you done blessed them. So in your time of need, they're like, what? What? I, they forgot that you blessed them. So the person that, 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 that Joseph blessed, who said he was going to look out for him, forgot all about him. So now he has to languish in jail even longer. So can you imagine this? Again, I can imagine Joseph just looking at God and saying, God, what's up now? I mean, really? I'm doing what you tell me to do. I'm working hard. I'm, I'm a man of integrity. I serve you. And it seems like I just keep going lower and lower and lower and lower. Do you kind of feel that way sometimes? It seems like the harder that you serve God or even people, it seems like you go lower and lower and lower and lower. And you just don't understand. And God says, remember this, my ways are higher than your ways. Yes. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. I know it's not looking like you wanted to look, but guess what? I got your back. I just ask for you to trust me. I just ask for you to, to just know that I got your back. 
And it may not be comfortable right now. It may not look the way that you want it to look, but I have your back. And so although, you know, this, his story is full of betrayal and bondage, God still placed this level of leadership in, in Joseph. That he still continued to excel and excel. And ultimately, because of the work that he did in jail, he got out and, and he was able to stand before Pharaoh, the leader of Egypt. And, and he did so good working for Pharaoh that Pharaoh made him governor over the land of Egypt. Over all the land, God gave him favor to, to, to lead the land of Egypt as a slave. He never said that he wasn't a slave anymore, but God gave him that level of responsibility where even his brothers and his daddy had to come see him, y'all. See, Joseph held his head up and kept working. Despite his circumstances, despite his situation, he didn't relinquish his thoughts and belief in what God had said about his life, and he just kept going. To the point that his, his brothers and his daddy had to come to him in a time of famine because he was rationing out the food during the time of famine. They had to come see him. Now, if you were Joseph, and your haters came back and had to come see you, how would you deal with them? All right, I'm going to leave it there because... Because I ain't gonna lie, I'm like, you know, I be, you know, I eventually would deal with them good, but I would, I would <laughs> take them through some holy hell. I, I just, I just, it would take everything in me to 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 do right by them. I'm just being honest. Now I know what the right thing is to do, but know what the right thing to do is, and doing the right thing, two different things. So if your name was in this book, would would the outcome be the same? Would you deal with your haters the way that Joseph dealt with his brothers who put him in the who, who set him on this path of, of slavery? His brothers did this to him. But let me tell you what his response was. In Genesis 45 and 5, he says, But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. He's talking to his brothers. For God sent me before you to preserve life. Amen. See, they were thinking, oh man, we, we sent Joseph down this life of slavery. And he was like, yeah, you did, you did it. Like, you're guilty as charged, but don't worry about it because God only used you through my current circumstances and situation in time to advance what God had called and destined for his eternity. Yes. See, all of this was intended to get him to where God wanted him to be. And he even lays it out, he said, for these two years, the famine has been in the land, and there are still five more years for uh, where there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. But God sent me before you to preserve your posterity for you and the earth, and to save your lives by a great deliverance. See, he even realized, even though the circumstances were slavery and everything, he realized that God had to allow them to do that to him so that he could turn around and save their lives. The lens of eternity, you all. I keep repeating that because in those tough times, you have to keep reminding yourself that God is so much greater. He's a big God. He's a greater God. He's above anything that you can ever think or imagine. And he's above even those circumstances that you're dealing with. So yes, Joseph said, yeah, you did it. You were guilty as charged. But what you did was just God using you to place me in the circumstance where I was so that I could save your life. The lens of eternity. He trusted God. See, there, there, there's nothing in here in, 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 in this passage that Joseph was, was happy with the situation. I don't imagine that Joseph was cool with it. I, I can even imagine that Joseph only was able to look through the lens of eternity after he had gone through time and those situations. He was only able to fully understand what he had gone through once he got to the end of what God had for him to go through. Yes. See, what God was doing was changing Joseph's perspective. 
He was changing his perspective. Changing it from time to eternity. Changing it to what, from what I can see right now and feeling the emotions that I feel right now to what God has called for me to do to manifest a change agent in eternity. So look at your lives. Look at, look at your situation. Whether it's right now or even in, in times past. Let's figure out how God has been moving in your circumstances. All the tribulation and trials, the, the drama, the money drama, the relationship trials, the, the, the challenges at work, the, the challenges in your health. See, sometimes God leads you down a path of sickness because he wants to change your perspective. Last week, I talked about uh, the, the, the subtitle was Stay Foolish, and, and I talked about, no, no, the week before that was Stay Foolish, and I talked about Steve Jobs had given this speech encouraging the people to stay hungry and to stay foolish. It was a powerful speech that he gave, and it was powerful, I believe, primarily because he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, and his perspective on life began to change. See, time didn't look the same way that it once looked through that sickness, but through that sickness, he was able to speak in a way that I think he never had spoken before. God can even use sickness in your life to change your circumstances or even to change other people's circumstances because it begins to change the lens of your perspective. Yes. That's what God wants from us. He's, he, said, he said, I want you to understand that I'm much bigger than you. Yeah, you're big and all that. Yeah, you have, you know, uh, you've experienced some success in life. You know, life, has, for some of us, has been good. We've done what we wanted to do. we played what we wanted to play. We've done the things that we thought about. He said, but as, as big and as bad and as mighty as you think that you are, I'm way bigger than you could ever imagine in your life. I'm above all of that. I'm above all of that. And, and he wants you to say, to be able to respond to that question of how big is your God. God wants you to be able to say emphatically, you're bigger than everything, God. Yes. You're bigger than all things. You're, thinking, you're bigger than my imaginations could be. You're bigger than my circumstances. You're bigger than my haters, God. You're bigger than my money, God. You're bigger than my sickness, God. You're bigger than the challenges in my community. Because many of us want to make some dramatic changes, dramatic changes in our community. And sometimes we feel like we don't have that ability to do anything because it's just one of us. I would even, I would even suggest to you that your life situation and challenges are even intended to empower you to make a difference in your community. I would recommend to you that you will look into your life and see how God has blessed your life, how he has taken you through situations to make a difference maker, to be a difference maker in your community. See, Joseph, his, his life situation wasn't just for him. It was, it was for his brothers. It was for his father. It was for the people of Israel. It was even for the foreign country that he was in. It was for Egypt. God sent him through his challenges so that he could be a blessing to the people that he was called to. My God. My God. Your challenges, your situations, your issues, yes, you won't like to be different. And not, maybe not all life, so, you know, and I'm not just speaking, you know, blanketly across the board, but, but, but I would submit to you that, that the, the situations, the circumstances that we find ourselves in are simply God's mechanism to change our perspective so that we can see through his lens of eternity to make an impact in the lives of people and our community. So ask yourself this question. How big is your God? How big is he? See, I know how big my God is, and I'm saying you're for a reason. Because your God may not be my God. I know how big my God is. My God is above everything. There is not a challenge in my life that he can't fix. See, see, because he is he has shown himself through the, the, the retelling of stories in the Bible. He has shown himself to be all kind of things. Says to Moses, he was a liberator for the people of, 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 of Israel. 
For, for Noah, he was uh, he was a savior actually to his family, and when God would just wipe out the earth, you know, he he is he's a healer, you know, to people when Jesus walked around just healing folk, he's he showed himself as a healer. He showed himself to be everything we need. Amen. Everything we need. not just some things, y'all, because there, there are some things in your situation, in your life circumstance, that you're like. Yeah, God, I can trust you over here, but that's 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 kind of big over there. Have you seen my level of debt, God? Have you seen my credit score, God? And there are certain things that you, if you be honest, you go back into the mold of, I got it, God. You ain't come through yet. I'm gonna take care of this. See, you sometimes because we were we were born up through this. We 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 have this mentality of I'll find a way to make one, and in the in the workforce, I'll and and in our environment that's good because it says to us that we'll be creative, we'll do what needs to be done uh, to get things done, we'll make an impact in our own life and in, in in the life of our community as well. But sometimes we take that too far because it's something that you can't find a way to make one in. There are some things that only God can, can, can make a change in. It's only, only that God can make a difference in your life. So I just want to say to all of you all, sometimes it's, 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 it's good for us to let go. And y'all have heard this. I don't like cliches that much, but let go and let God. Because he wants you to do that. He, he, he's... You know, God is saying, when are you going to figure this thing out? When are you going to realize that you can't do this all by yourself? Amen. Yeah, I know you got goals. You know, you got things that you want to accomplish in life. But at what point are those goals and accomplishments that you want to be? At what point are they outside of my will? And when are you going to be willing to lay it all down? Say, God, I, I, for you I live, for you I'll die. What is it going to take for you to be able to say, God, I know I want to do all these great things, God, but if it is not in your will, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. See, in my life, I've had these goals and these aspirations. And what I'm doing right now wasn't part of it. If you know me for any period of time, you know me preaching wasn't something that I wanted to do. I had my plans, and my plans even, even wasn't even connected to the political world. God just kind of sent me down in that direction. It wasn't my plans. My plans were to be rich and prosper. <laughs> that was Lee May's plan. I wanted to make money. I wanted to make a lot of money. And yes, I said, I'm going to do all these good things with a God. Yeah, I'm going to bless your people. I'm going to give back to the church. I'm going to tithe. I'm going to bless people and all that. But Lee May wanted to make money. But at some point in my life, I had to say, God, I know that I want to do all these things. But if it's not what you want to do, I ain't going to lie right now. I ain't going to like it. But I'm going to do it. Amen. When I felt God was calling me to pastor, I, I didn't like it. It wasn't something I was like, yes, I get to, yes. 52 times a year I get to preach and I can't do everything I want, I, I really enjoy doing. <laughs> I got to stop doing it. Okay. And, and, but I'll do it, God. I, I'll do it. Because if, if, if that's what you want me to do, that's what I'm ready to do. Because that's where the blessings of life are. The blessings of life are doing the will of the Father. And so you can't hear, you can't do the will of the Father if you're not in this intimate relationship with Him. Because it's in, in, in a time of famine in our lives, in a time of tremendous stress, and challenges. It's only in that intimate relationship with God that you can get through it. 
One of the things that used to bless me when, 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 when the AJC had this love affair with me and just wanted to put me on the front page every day, they was like, we love you so much, let me go put you on the front page every few days, whatever. But one of the things that used to bless me, y'all, is when people would come up to me and was like, Lee, I just want to say this to you. I appreciate how you handle yourself in those situations. And see, that blessed me because internally, oh, I was a mess. I was ready to cuss, kill, just, I was ready to go off on everybody, everything in me wanted to act different than how I was responding in public. But see, that didn't have anything to do with me. That was my relationship with Christ. See, something about, something about trials and tribulation, it, it, it draws you closer to Him, right? And God uses that to get you closer to Him. And, 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 and see, here's where we mess up. See, we, 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 we bow down to Him. We start, we start reading the Bible like we ain't never did before. We start praying on a daily basis. We start saying, whatever you want, God, I'm going to do, and all that. And once we get to the other side, we forget about God. And God is saying, see, you messed up. Because he wants that same passion, that same zeal that you have for him in those trials and tribulations. He wants that every day of your life. He wants you to be yearning for him every day of your life. And so when, when those trials come up in your circumstances, you're able to say, God, I love you so much. 